You're listening to Skeptoid. I'm Brian Dunning from Skeptoid.com. Lonnie Zamora and the Socorro UFO In any tome on UFOs worth its salt, the name of Lonnie Zamora always looms large. He is that species of eyewitness held in the highest regard by ufologists, a police officer. Police officers, so it is said, are never mistaken. They always know exactly what they're looking at. They cannot be fooled. They are experts at identifying anything they see, and their memories are faultless, all necessary requirements of their job. So when Lonnie Zamora saw an egg-shaped UFO in Socorro, New Mexico in 1964, it quickly became regarded as one of the most reliable. To this day, his sighting is cited by some as proof of alien visitation, and it is one of the legendary unknown cases listed in Project Blue Book. Today, we're going to look at Zamora's report, the theories suggested to explain it, and see what lessons there are to be learned. Socorro, New Mexico is not renowned as a great metropolis. It is home to the modest campus of New Mexico Tech, the New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology, and enough infrastructure to support a small local mining industry. Its population has never managed to crack 10,000, yet its sighting on the banks of the Rio Grande allow it to be a spot of green in an otherwise bleak desert landscape. In 1964, Officer Zamora was chasing a reckless speeding driver when he heard what he thought might be a dynamite storage shack exploding, so he abandoned the chase and turned up toward a perlite mine. Here's what he described two days later to radio interviewer Walter Schrode. I went up that little road for about half a mile, I guess. Came up to this little barking deal there on the side of the road, and I caught a glance out the, of the window, looked to my left, and seen this white object on the ground. So I thought it might be a car that had turned over. Uh -huh. So I was really in a real big hurry going out there to investigate. Thought maybe somebody would be hurt. That time I saw this white egg tape, egg shape looking object. Is that, is that something like a, like an egg, you mean? Yeah, yeah, from the distance I was, it looked like an egg to me. About the size of a car, I think uh, someone said. Yes, sir, it looked like a car that turned over. Uh -huh. That's why I say it's the size of a car. As he got closer, he saw something like two people near the object. Uh, did they have helmets on, like spacemen or anything? No, sir, I wouldn't say it. there are people. I just, I saw something white, white coverall. That's what I could say. It looked like there was something in white coverall. Right. But you didn't, you couldn't identify them as actually being a human being as no, you sir. and I are. No, sir, I couldn't. It blasted off with a loud rocket-like sound, and Zamora saw flames. It was very low to the ground. At the time I was seeing it, it was very low to the ground up to the perlite uh, meal there, and then it started gaining altitude. Nobody doubted Zamora's remarkable report. The FBI came out and verified burn marks in the desert scrub from the object's rockets. Air Force investigators recorded a detailed account from Zamora for Project Blue Book. Their version was more explicit. The figures were definitely human-like in white suits, and the vehicle was smooth and white with no windows or doors, shaped either like a football or an oval. Its only feature was an insignia in red, about two feet high, an inverted V with three lines beneath it. For some time, there's been an interesting candidate explanation floating around. At that time in 1964, NASA was testing an early engineering model of Surveyor, the lunar probe that went to the moon in 1966. This testing was done out of Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico at the White Sands Missile Range, and researchers have found records showing that the model was being carried by helicopter on the same day, although earlier in the morning, as Lonnie Zamora's sighting. Some have even pointed to early logos of various Hughes subsidiaries, Surveyor was built by Hughes Aircraft, as possible matches for the insignia drawn by Zamora. Surveyor landed with rockets, the same loud rockets that Zamora heard. And what would Hughes technicians be wearing besides white coveralls? In some articles describing this theory, it appears to be a virtual lock. Maybe I'm just a skeptic, but I find it to be 
a terrible explanation. For one thing, Holloman is directly adjacent to the White Sands Missile Range where the surveyor testing was done. Yet Socorro is a full 150 kilometers away. It can hardly be argued that the engineers strayed slightly outside the boundaries. For another, never once in the recorded history of NASA or the Air Force have they transported their experimental craft far from their remote desert test facilities and directly into populated towns to test them and it strains credibility to conclude that they might have felt that doing so was the best course in this case. Surveyor was a tripod of aluminum trusses with a couple boxes at its base. By no remote description can it be said to look like an egg, an oval, a football, or an overturned car. It doesn't even have a flat surface on which an insignia could appear. And if it did, it would like every piece of hardware NASA had ever flown, have had the NASA logo displayed, not some obscure Hughes subsidiary logo. Surveyor had never been designed with any takeoff ability. Its retros slowed its descent, then it fell the final three meters to the surface where it stayed. Zamora's description of a craft taking off and flying away had nothing to do with anything related to Surveyor. Anyway, the engineering model had to be transported by helicopter, and Zamora probably would have noticed that. If the claim is that the oval-shaped craft that Zamora saw take off was the Air Force helicopter, then he was the most monumental ignoramus in the history of ignoramuses, and I don't hear anyone saying that. So I'm going to go out on a limb and say no. Whatever Lonnie Zamora saw was most definitely not the Surveyor engineering model from Holloman. A more persuasive explanation came from the unlikely source of Linus Pauling, the famous chemist who is as well known for his two Nobel Prizes as he is for having descended into crankery in his later years, both with the promotion of vitamin C as a miracle cure-all, and less well known for his interest in UFOs. After his death, a letter was found in Pauling's files from 1968, which he'd sent to Sterling Colgate, then president of New Mexico Tech, and received a handwritten reply on the bottom. As a P.S. to his letter, Pauling had asked Colgate what the people at New Mexico Tech thought about the Lonnie Zamora incident, and Colgate scrawled back, I have good indication of student who engineered the hoax. The student has left. Cheers, Sterling. You can see a copy of this letter on the online transcript of this episode at Skeptoid.com. Students at tech universities have a long and time-honored tradition of pranking. And it turns out that Lonnie Zamora had worked on campus for several years, where he had developed a reputation for being somewhat rigid and impatient with the students. Consequently, he was not overlooked by those with mischief on their minds when he became a police officer. UFO researcher Tony Bregalia corresponded with Dr. Colgate by email several times in 2012 as well as with two others from New Mexico Tech, to get some more of the story, although no former students' names were forthcoming. What it came down to was this. The Energetics Lab on campus stocked all kinds of pyrotechnics, more than enough to make all the audio and visual rocket and explosion sounds that Zamora saw and heard, as well as the burned scrub. White lab suits were conveniently available. And in the exact words of the university president himself, the craft itself consisted of a candle in a balloon, not sophisticated. With one driver to possibly lure Zamora to the scene by speeding, perhaps another to tow the big white balloon off into the distance at high speed when it took off. No lower to the Bernard mine, then from there on, they just so fast that he could barely do it's also noteworthy that in the Air Force report, when Zamora radioed in and was asked what it looked like, his exact words were, It looks like a balloon. One criticism of the hoax explanation is that these alleged students were never named or came forward. But I'm not surprised. In this case especially, there's no way I'd expect any real hoaxers to ever reveal themselves. Why not? Because when you're a college student and your little afternoon prank on the local constabulary turns out to mobilize not only the feds, but 
half the branches of the armed services, some of whom work with your professors, and you'd rather graduate than spend the rest of your life at Fort Leavenworth, you tend to zip your lip. No, I'm not at all surprised that these students, assuming they existed, never went public with their involvement. The faculty of New Mexico Tech certainly seemed satisfied that their little rapscallions were responsible, and that those same rapscallions had the means and a motivating lack of other diversions. It's the only complete explanation anyone has proposed that neatly checks all the boxes, fits all the descriptions, and requires no alien intervention. No doubt this will not be a popular explanation among those ufologists whose preferred conclusion is an alien spacecraft, but that's going to be the case no matter what. As for Lonnie Zamora, he stayed in Socorro, had a good full career as a police officer, and was buried there in town when he died in 2009. Not a word written by anyone about him cast the slightest doubt on his sincerity, his honesty, or the integrity with which he conducted himself in all the official interviews that were thrust upon him. Moreover, he was said to be friendly and well-liked, a good patriot and family man. He just didn't want to talk to you about UFOs anymore. He'd been there and done that. Just a quick reminder for something you can do to get other people to benefit from this podcast that you yourself enjoy so much. Give two and two. Share an episode with two friends and spend two minutes giving Skeptoid a nice review on iTunes or the podcast portal of your choice. These reviews are super important. Small independent shows really struggle to stay relevant today when the majority of podcast traffic is owned by commercial networks with vast resources. Your positive reviews really do help to keep us near the top of the listings where new listeners might find out about the show. So, two and two, it really helps a lot. Thank you so much. You're listening to Skeptoid, a listener-supported program. I'm Brian Dunning from Skeptoid.com. <laughs>